about tight binding? Uh, is it you, Jonah? Yes, it's Jonah. Uh, I cannot see who's talking. Okay, tell me. Um, yes, so uh, the question I have is about um, about uh, getting uh, information from um, if I so so normally this is coming from the fact that if I want to there are different models of course to study uh, band structure of materials um, within the nearly free electron it turns out that I cannot uh, particularly know uh, which bands, sorry, which of the orbitals of my of my um, of my atom is contributing to um, to 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 the formations of the bands. So I only can maybe just get information from that. This is how the band looks. Uh, this is these are all the field states. Uh, this is the band gap. This is the structure of the band. Um, but from the shape of the band, you can see if the if it's coming from something more localized, then the band is especially flat, or it is something more parabolic, which is more free electron-like nature, S or P electron. That you can see right away. Uh, yeah, I, I agree because uh, if if it is uh, flat, then I know that there uh, there is like huge effective masses and they are not moving really. But uh, uh, I mean, uh, but I can't say particularly which orbital, say maybe it's 2p orbital that is like uh, that these electrons are coming from uh, that uh, sort of, uh, uh, if, if, if in, in another sense, if, if, if the band is really dispersive, uh, very COVID, then, then I know, okay, there are really light electrons here, but uh, what, I can't really drive an information to tell me that, oh yeah, this is coming from 2px or 3d state or something. Uh, it depends a bit on the atomic structure levels, you know, it depends how many three different these you have, but usually you can have quite a good idea of what it is. It's more difficult to differentiate the 3p and 4s, for example, those are similar. But uh, I don't know, I have 3, 3 or 4 eggs, and then I have uh, 3 D. And this much I know usually. I can tell from the band structure. Uh, within the free electron? Uh, oh, in general. Within the, the nearly free? Uh, the things that you asked me from the nearly free electron. No. Uh, uh, free electron will actually describe a free electron like state, yes. Yeah. Uh, what localized states really in that picture? Um, yeah, another thing, sorry, sorry that I'm saying this. Uh, uh, okay, I should stop. Uh, Lian is asking for the Zoom link and I would uh, ask my question later. Uh, there is Lian? Yeah, she's asking for the Zoom link. So I, I would stop and send to her then uh, maybe ask later. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so today's idea was I would again review a little bit I would compare between, I mean, the tight binding method and the nearly free electron method. Um, I know you know all of this. There is nothing new. I would just like to, to make sure that we are on the same wavelength. And this is my last thing I mentioned. Maybe you have time to solve something, but somehow I'm feeling two hours with just the lecture, so I'm not so sure. So for the tight binding approximation, what were our assumptions? So we know um, that we can approximate that the potential on the on the side should not be feel that on the one side should not be feeling too much the effect of other side. This is one of our basic uh, assumptions for the time binding. So it feels something from the other side, but it's not the main effect. Um, so the close to the to, to one side, you can reasonably well approximate the Hamiltonian by the atomic one. Okay, and that the bound levels actually highly that the bound levels are well localized. 
so that you have states which actually belong to one site. This means localized also in a space localized. That is localized in energy, localized in space. Um, so this, both of these methods actually can be shown in uh, perturbation theory picture. So let me see, I can use the whole blackboard, I think. Um, nearly free electron model and the tie binding. I think uh, Lynn is asking, I, I think she went to get uh, breakfast, so she's asking if she can come to the class. Um, oh yes, I see now the message. Um, I would love it, but I'm not sure it's allowed. Um, I, I, I don't think it's allowed, I'm sorry. I'm, I would love to have all of you here for myself and for you, but uh, I, I'm not sure it's allowed. Uh, we can ask, but I, I think not, that it should be strictly online. When I asked for the room to teach from the room, they, they made sure I will say that no, nobody will, will else will be present, just me. So, and how that you cannot speak, Lynn? Your microphone is not working? Uh, she's using her phone, so... Uh... Uh, I see. Um, Upa, I don't know. Um, I think maybe she's in the computer room. I, I see. Um, she has more, no microphone, maybe. Oh, oh okay. Um, maybe on the phone one can ask a question uh, or like writing. Um, I can make sure, I mean, I can ask for the next time if one of you can be present, but then also you guys should agree who that one will be every time. It's not, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I think not. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe if you connect by phone for the, uh, okay, <laughs> okay, Lynn, uh, I will continue, yeah. So what is the unperturbed I forgot how to write wave function in the nearly free. What is that? It is a free electron. What is it in tie binding? So it's a plane wave. In the tie binding, it's atomic function. But you know, I'm, I'm just summarizing uh, the whole thing. Um, and then perturbation Hamiltonian. So for the nearly free, it, does, it is a weak potential, you remember. Periodic, a weak periodic potential. Um, yeah, periodic. Okay, but for the tight binding, what is my perturbation? Have you thought of it? I mean, this is kind of obvious. This is uh, a little less obvious. Yes, Jonathan. A crystal, a crystal field. Uh... I would say crystal field, but uh, it's also weak, but uh, yeah. yeah it is what I just mentioned. It is the difference of the total potential, uh, minus B minus R, minus atomic potential at that site. And this we define as crystal field. So this thing, should be small. Both of them should be small for the perturbation theory approach to, to be applicable, to be valid. And indeed, we use it in those limits. 
So when do we use near lift electron model? For the systems which have free S or P electrons, like alkali metals. And when do we use side binding? Partially filled yeah. these states. Uh, sorry? Partially filled these states and. Um, we localize them. Yeah. Yes. Also, coinsulated. Yes. Group four. Yeah, also coinsulated. So there is a big difference. There are kind of two limiting cases. Uh, rarely, I mean, rarely you can apply this and this one. They're limiting, they're opposite. And then, uh, what did I want to say? For the time binding, um, maybe you did this with Nadia, I'm not sure, but I will repeat it with you. It's important. Um, atomic levels. So you have an atom and you have atomic levels. What happens when you put these atoms together? Did you do it with Nadia? So I have one atom here on one kind one there, and then I'm kind of forming a crystal. I'm putting them closer and closer. So these are my atomic levels, whatever you want to call them, 1s, 2s, 2p, whatever. I don't care for the names. Um, so I have a level here, a level here, a level here. Um, as I make them closer, so this is um, this. Space two and minus one. Yeah, one over space one. Yeah, this is when they are infinitely distant, and here will be when they get closer. As you put them together, you actually lose this level character. You have more and more overlaps of the orbitals, and you start creating more and more state in which electron can be found. Here, you have only one energy in electron, very discrete. As you bring them closer, you start forming a larger interval of energy. Oops. You start creating band. Is this idea clear to everyone? Uh, now tell me, uh, Joshua. As they come closer, they start overlapping. This exactly corresponds to T, to the, uh, to the hopping term. This bit of the band. And this is due to overlaps due to interactions of the orbitals, how weak they are, they're interacting and they're allowing more and more energy state, more and more energy values. So you don't have any more discrete levels, you have bands. And this you will see like in time binding, typical solution will be something of this type, cosine kx, if this is kx and this is energy, this is typical. But then your band has a width. This is a width. And this is this what I'm talking about. This is schematic. And this is not uh, um, so this is my band width. And this directly depends on T on the hopping term in the type binding. And so it's these of, things here are very important. Yes, Joshua? It's more of increasing the, uh, the bandwidth as you increase the one over spacing. Exactly, exactly. Why? Because they interact more and more. Mm. Okay. I mean, if you have two sides, oops, what's the drawing? They barely interact at large distance. But when you bring them closer, they have much stronger overlap. So there is a larger overlap between the, uh, the yes. potentials here. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, here it's confusing because to see you, I cannot be at the camera, so <laughs> I might be looking at you or at the camera, not both. Um, okay. Um, so I think uh, this is what I wanted to say on this time binding. Um, they are both done in the independent electron approximation, both nearly free and the time binding. So here there are no interactions. And I owe to Lin. Lin, are you here still? Um, Lin? Yes. No, Lin. Are, are you here? I owe you answers to the questions, but if you're not here, if you went to have breakfast. Um, ah, okay, you're writing something. Uh, you mean that we have larger energy bands? include the energy level lower than the initial, more preferable, but in fact there is case that atoms do not prefer to be together. Uh, what if the atoms that you bring together do not prefer to be? Uh, then you don't form a crystal. If they don't want to be together, you don't form a crystal. But if you do form a crystal, and actually you cannot keep doing this infinitely, because if you make them closer, closer, their cores start interacting. And that's very dependent. So yes, you can do this thing up to a point. You can go from the equilibrium lattice to like few percent, um, to a few percent uh, near. If you go too close, you, are, you have to be under huge pressures. And then you have problems. Then you have some special effects, like the course of these two interacting, which are not entering. This is just the idea of the time binding to understand the trend to the distance. Okay, that's okay. Um, uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, but but in that regime, um, the born upon Heimer approximation that we often talk about, uh, sort of disappears in this case because uh, here within tight binding we think that the, the electron is really bound but then we can think about the atoms sort of having some nuclear uh, motion okay we don't go into any superconductivity regimes into anything uh, we are not creating plasma and stuff yes in some situations you can have this issue of the ball of i'm just talking of putting them nearer together so we are going from crystal, from atomic picture, bringing them together and creating the overlaps. Then you come to the equilibrium situation and you still want to press it a bit more, and you can do it. And then you have even stronger overlaps. But of course, if you bring it closer, many things are breaking. Um, yes, I will try to answer, but the answer is not very short to me. Question so, of. Oh. And then again, I will keep you until 11. Do you have a lecture at 11? Yes. Yes. I'm really sorry, I'll, I'll try to be fast. So one of the interesting questions was, how do you, sorry, sorry. in the, I think it's useful, that's why I'm doing it for everyone. I think it's useful uh, let me, question. Let me okay. who, who is asking? Yeah, it's Felus. Ah, Felus, okay. Yeah, um, I'm talking about the overlap. Is it depending on the separation of the atoms or just the number of atoms in the crystal plane? Separation. Separation. Okay. The number of atoms will just bring you how many levels you will have. The number of states in an atom. Just give different levels. But if you put them closer, it's a distance which causes the overlap. Um, the question was, um, for the 2p orbital, which I drew like that, actually just what you asked now in was very similar to this, so that's what reminded me. I drew this and Lina, can you make the phases different? Do they have to be this way? Because in this way we had only p P bonds, uh, sorry, pi, pi bonds. Huh? 
and the stigma was antibonding. And the question was, can you make it different phases that you have them all bonded? And actually, it's not immediate answer. You have to think of the block theorem. So these are my sites at a distance A. No? And the block theorem says that I can write the state at the, the K. This form. This is a phase. And this can be done on any R. But I can choose just to see what happens at the um, n times a R at the, at the positions. Uh, how to say? In a cell axis. So I'm looking how the phase changes at the atomic side, okay? At the gamma point, I have tier one. I'm plotting the same identical Px and Py orbitals at every side. And this is what I get, okay? Um, a square like this. And this brilliant zone, gamma, x, y, and m. Okay, at the x point, I will have p e on the i k, k x is pi over a times k plus i times zero times a. This is k x and k y. Okay, times the This is at the X. So what will I have? And the next side here will have the opposite phase. This is exactly how the, the phase changes. Don't ask me for the in between. I cannot draw it. But for these cases, it's kind of intuitive to see. And I think it's actually even useful to understand, to get some intuition. So here it will be the opposite one, plus minus, um, minus plus. But here remains the same in the y, the same. So here I will have sigma x, and this is it. So here I have bonding pi and anti-bonding sigma. Here I have bonding sigma and anti-bonding pi. No, actually the, the pi is bonding also. But then along py, it will be opposite. And I can do it also for the endpoint, where they'll be changing both in x and in y. And for your intuition, you can just think of it and make out what you expect that the energy will be for these points. How would you order if I draw the band structure gamma x m? Where do you expect to be the lowest, where the highest energy? Just based on the block function. Do you understand? Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, why? Why in the case? Uh, why in the point X you have that uh, orbital? Because at the point X it is pi over a. This is X point. Pi yeah. over a. So pi over a gives minus one. A phase. And then it means that at every side, just for a, you know. I'm doing it at the site A, 2A, 3A. I will flip the phase. You understand? The phase is flipping because of the phase vector. Mm, yeah. So this is easy because we know the, the shape of the orbital. We know it's a PX orbital. I mean, this is very useful to build the intuition. 
So to understand, to get a feeling about the block state, what they really are. I'm plotting them here only at the sides of the lattice. And I can just from the overlaps, uh, also what you should know is that the, the sigma bond is always stronger than the pi bond. So if you have a binding bond, sigma, when you create a big overlap here, it is a uh, P sigma. This is always stronger than the, how do they call it, P, than the P to pi, if they are both bonding, because here there is a stronger overlap. It's a shorter distance. So knowing that, you can actually derive how the energy order will be between these three points. And then you can check it in the, in the type binding. Hmm? Just, just by this reason. Tell me if any questions. I mean, I can all solve it, but the time is going. It's almost 9.30 and uh, um, is it okay? I assume there is no questions. It is all clear. All your solos that you cannot understand anything. No. Yes, Jonah. Yeah, I, it is okay. Uh, but uh, I just have like uh, some questions in my mind, but I I would ask later. Okay. Okay. Um. No, I think it's it's useful way to useful thing to go through to think. It's nothing intelligent, nothing too, nothing advanced. It's just the application of what we know. And okay, a little bit of, of overlaps, sigma and pi bonds, and you can actually get a good uh, idea of how the energy order should be. Mm. And, I mean, that really gives you a feel that when you plot a band structure, it actually is something that makes sense. It's not something that it, you cannot derive by just thinking, no? And uh, wait, there was one. Uh, my my concern, which of course you said we shouldn't ask you, is if I want to think about M, if they are in between, there will be some sort of flips uh, in both ways. But I don't know how the flips would look. Uh, oh, yeah. Kind of. I'm not to spend too much time. You will flip sides and then you'll get the band one direction and the other direction. Yeah. And then each of them, you can write. What is bonding? What is anti-bonding? Bonding is normally denoted as sigma, anti-bonding is sigma star. But okay. Mm. And based on that, you can kind of have a good estimate on the at least order with which point the, the energy will be the highest. Okay. You can mm. roughly estimate this version, roughly, but okay, logically, intuitively. Mm. Um, Nat Natasha. Yes, Evan. Uh, I am a little bit conscious of the drawing. I mean, I, I get your point where we change phase in the X point, but uh, why why you have like four points for gamma and four points for X? Because I mean, uh, in the previous class, I think we, we draw like for each K point, like one, like PX, PY, like this orbital. Oh, I'm not getting your question, sorry, at all. So, in plotting the sides. No, I'm plotting the sides. And I'm choosing for different k points how it looks in real space. Huh? So one k point, this is gamma, this is x. I can draw for n if you if you always mm -hmm. how it looks in real space. I can draw it infinitely, you know. I mean, four of them, it's, it's nothing. Is this your question? Uh, yeah, I think. Sorry, your it's voice okay. is it's not very clear, th th your voice. Uh, my voice is not clear. Uh, here, I cannot control anything. Oops, I'm not sure I was recording. Oops. I hope it's recording. I hope they took it. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to do it. Um, yeah, I don't even know how to. Um, the recording started until the start uh, of the, the lecture. 
I said uh, ICTP is recording. It's okay. Uh, but it is the recording of the Zoom, but not the record in the lecture room, I think. Oh, yeah. So you you have to check Natasha whether the the button is uh is sparkling uh the red the red one sparkling now it is but it wasn't sparkling hey yeah, because this is not from last year. This is one slide in the previous year. The lecture is, but this is something I did just because Lynn asked me a question. So this you won't find them. Um, so this is a real space. This is what, what was confusing. I choose one K point and draw the wave function in the real space. How the orbitals, this is exactly how the electron clouds are. And I can change the phase depending on the k point. I just changed it. So for the pi point, it's a gamma. It was a x point, pi over a zero. Mm, so this is because it's in the real space. In the uh, real space. Okay, think of it, really think of it. I, it might be useful for, for a few things, not just for the question that Lynn asked, but for a few things to, to kind of get uh, changing from real space to reciprocal and uh, the meaning of, I mean, the block functions, one has to think of it and it kind of becomes all clear and meaningful. But if you don't spend time absorbing it, it's uh, not understood, most likely. Um, and there was a second question, which I was a bit doubting to answer. It was about uh, um, the hopping term. So we had the graphene of the picture. And we had A and B sites, which for us are the same sites. So it was rather obvious, the same atoms. Sorry, it was obvious that if you act with A and B on B on A, the, the whole term is kind of the same. Um, and then if you have two different atoms, um, you would think it's still the same. But actually, I knew a case where it's not the same, and I got confused. So you can prove that if I'm not calling this permission, which it is. That the time binding term AB has to be equal to the complex B A conjugate, sorry, to the conjugate T B of A, B A. Um, for us, it doesn't matter because we have it all real. So here it doesn't matter. But if you have spin orbit, or if you put some B field, magnetic field in the system, then you will actually get a complex uh, hopping term. And this is what I was remembering. So this is true. For us, we don't have it complex. It is identical. So this is a, a fast answer. OK. This was the old stuff. I have to start the lecture now. So, so, and, uh, so, so in the case of spin orbit, you mean where we put everything, we just put everything stuck in the potential and forget about uh, uh, not including any corrections, say, uh, with the uh, wave functions or anything? You will have a term, yes. You okay. will have a spin orbit term in the, the hamiltonic, in the atomic part also. The interaction will be different. That's why one has to be careful. But without it, we can just say the other thing. Okay, I, I should start with the lecture because uh, it's still fine already. So today, the plan was to, to see what we can do with the band structure theory, with the band theory, what we learned. And, um, okay. Application. Of the 
time theory. And today we'll do the transport. We will have to continue next time. Transport properties. And then uh, um, next, well, the second lecture from now will, will be some uh, optical properties. So when I say transport, what do you understand by transport? What kind of transport? Uh, John, a value function, yo, no. <laughs> no, it is too much to, to discuss now. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm not managing to, to do the, the, the basic stuff. Um, so what is transport? So when I say transport, what do I assume here? Electrical current, conductivity, this kind Electric, of thing. Electric on transfer, transport. So how electrons move, how they create current, if they do. So a bit of it, we all the kind of have an idea. We know that insulators do not conduct and that the metals do. And this we know from the band structure. But actually, we can say more based on just the band structure. So, the, the, um, the first theories, I will not go in detail, but I find it quite interesting. Um, the first theories, like Drew's model. Um, which were extremely ad hoc. Actually, I'm not completely off. And we will derive based on the best theory and some kind of semi classical approach, we will get something very similar to his result, but which actually holds. So, what did Drude model? Uh, what did Drude say? He imagined the crystal as having like um, positive spheres of which electron bound. And that was all he really took into account. And uh, he derived, he said that the current depends on the electric field. I use this symbol for the electric field. So please uh, forgive me. I did my first lectures without looking at Nadia's and I realized we have the opposite sign for energy and the field. Uh, bear with me. And Drude found in his semi macroscopic model that this conductivity is a coefficient between the field and the current is proportional on the density of electron, the charge, the time of scattering, and the mass, no? Just the mass. Nothing else. And we will actually see that this is quite a good description. It is in the independent electron approximation. So everything in this course is done in the independent level. Maybe later in the second semester, you will go do some more many body effects. Um, Sorry, Natasha. Uh, yes, who's talking? Lynn, yes. Julia, ah, okay. I cannot differentiate. Tell me, Julia. Yes, I, I just want to know what is the, the, the T? Uh, it's uh, the scattering time. It's the, did I put any better name? It's the mean free time. It's a mean free time between two uh, scattering. So you have electrons scattering, you know, bouncing off electrons. This was his model, which is the simplest you can imagine. And this is the time that the electron spends free without scattering. Mean free time, okay. Mean free time. And then Summerfeld, actually, this guy had a problem in explaining um, heat capacity. It was anomalous. And the zoner felt came later um, and just added 
um, forming a right distribution in this in, in this model. And it explained the specific heat capacity. All very simple, very after that, there were like a bunch of models how they developed. Uh, there was a semi-classical Boltzmann equation, which takes distribution of electrons into account. And then in the much later time, more recent time, there was a Kuba formula. There was the ballistic transport, Landau and Boutiquet formula, but we are not doing those. The goal of this is actually, of these two lessons, is to just see some basic properties based on the dispersion, energy dispersion. This is all we will do. We won't derive any formulas, anything, but we will actually come with it very close to this, which is actually even valid. So for the conductivity, um, I can actually express the current as a sum of all the velocities Oh, okay. Charge uh, over charge. How fast the charges are moving? So sum of the e charge times the velocity. This is I will be observing current in this way. This will be my measure of current, but I don't know the velocity. So let me see how I can actually derive the velocity based on what I know, and all I know from the band structure from the band theory is how the energy depends on K. So I'm starting from here. Uh, yes, Maha? It is, it is the sum over K, the momentum. Um, yes. You can also do the sum over all the state, sorry, over all the levels to be more precise. The charge is the same. Um, but this is the velocity. Yeah, you can actually check the units. It can be. If you want to be more correct, you can put a term how to sum it. Yes. Uh, you so add it minus uh, sign or no? Uh, because of electron negative sign. Mm -hmm. It's the current of electrons because I'm describing electrons now. Um, uh, sorry. Who is asking? Jonah? Yes. Uh, this is just to uh, clarify something. Uh, the the tau uh, sometimes in literature this is this is called relaxation time scattering time. Uh, is it, yeah, is it uh, does it when when the terminologies are used differently? Does it involve some other uh, meanings or in some certain regimes? Say scattering in electrons. So we talk relaxation. So. What Drew did, it is a very, it's almost like a toy model. It is a toy model. It is as simple as it can be. We will come to this from a completely different uh, angle. Uh, very intuitive, very hand-wavy, because uh, nobody wants to go into heavy mathematics here. And the idea is to give you basic notions. Then you will do some more advanced course and do it mathematically. But the model is different. We are not going to use this model. We will just start from the energy relation, uh, energy dependence of K from the band structure. So we will have this, and we will see, knowing this, how we can say anything about the conductivity. So just this. So the, it's a different model, but in the end, we will come to something, we will include something similar. It's not the same meaning. Um, okay. So I want to know the velocity. How to how can I derive the velocity? Uh, it will be by definition. An expectation value. Actually, I have to use the end. This is the band index. So first band, second band, third band. The velocity will depend on the band where electron belongs. So this is the end band, and it's an expectation value of the momentum operated by by m. Then I 
back in the 90s operator. And uh, I, use, yeah, I use like a way to block functions. I will write it as the periodic part. And this is minus I A. But I'm missing the E part. Okay, you stop me if there is any problem on your side or if we make a mistake also. No. Okay. Um, now I will act with this nabla on the K. So I will keep E minus I K R minus I H N and I K R K R. Oops. Plus, I'm left on this part. And this will be then just become a P if I add. So I would have that. This and this, and then this is the P. That's okay. So this gradient acted first on the exponent and then on the on the wave function, on the periodic part of the wave function. So what we have here, this will cancel, and we just have an expectation value of k, because this is not an operator, and times this, this gives plus one. So it will h k over n plus the okay, plus here the periodic part so this is my velocity what did we get here Take into account, let's take a plane wave. Um, yes, who is talking? Maha? Uh, How did you get the sum of, uh, uh, of the two terms? Uh, um, I mean, the second term. Okay, so then this gradient acts on the periodic part of the wave function. It acts first on this and then on this. Okay, when it acts on the A, on this corner, I just get the K part. When it acts on this one, I'm writing this is then go here. And then I get this operator, which is P over M, acting on this. So this is one. And I just get a P between the periodic part of the wave function. Hmm? Is it okay? I didn't get how it is the sum. No, I have two terms. If I act with the gradient, Oh, I see, I see. Like the, the derivative of the product. Uh, two functions. Then it's the yeah. uh, number f times g plus f times uh, yeah, 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 I see. I see. Thank you. All right, it's, it's good to, to make sure that everything is good. Um, okay. If you take a wave function, which is the plane wave. Okay. What will happen here? I will have this term. 
But this part is a constant. There is new case here is a constant. So I cannot do gradient on it. It gives me zero. If I plant, if I take out the plane weight and use this formula, this term gives me zero. So right away, I see that uh, finding the, the velocity for the periodic Hamiltonian using block state, I'm getting an extra term, which I would not maybe naively expect based on my intuition uh, with plane weight. We have an extra term, and it's not quite clear what this term means. Um. Yes. What do you mean but, uh, by uh, UK is uh, constant? It's not UK of R. No. Okay. I mean, you take a free electron. Hmm? Mm -hmm. it, 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 this is the plane rate. But this is a block function. But we know that the free electron is just this one. Um, Which means that the periodic part is one. It's a constant. Doesn't have any dependence on k or r. This is a constant always. I just have this. So when I say put it in this term, this is a constant. Gradient of a constant is a zero. And I'm left with this. So this term here is coming. It be, uh, be, be, uh, exists only for wave functions, which are at least modulated plane waves. OK. Now my goal is to try to understand this. Um, you see I'm here now. I can use this part of the label. <laughs> and then I will, um, maybe it's not clear right away why, but I will start with deriving the finding, the gradient of energy. And then you will understand why it's important. Um, I think it's the fastest way to, to come to understand it. So just uh, take it for a few minutes and you will understand why I'm doing this. So I want to find the gradient of energy. Um, this is what I'm finding. The energy is defined as. Also for the end level. The value of your Hamiltonian. But you also derive with Nadia a different way that is The K dependent Hamiltonian. Do you remember when you take into account the phase part and the Hamiltonian, you get the HK? Do you remember that? I will write the HK here. Okay. I don't have to check it. Is it plus or minus? I don't remember. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the it's gradient plus. of IK, yeah. yeah plus. Plus. So I will add, I will replace this age of K with this. I hope to have enough space because I would like to keep that formula there, but let's see if I'll manage. Um, so the gradient of energy of k of the end level is equal um u k n then minus a m um Uh, 
sorry. Uh, it's not. It's not clear when you write in this part. It's better to write. Ah, it's not clear. Okay, sorry. Uh, then I'll write this formula again. Okay. I'll keep it for a little while, maybe I'm able to finish it, but <laughs> I'm not so sure the, the gradient. So I want to take the gradient of k of this. This doesn't depend on k, will be with zero. This term here will be 2i uh, number, and it will be minus 2 times k. Actually, um, no, actually I skipped one step, sorry. You can even keep it, but I skipped one step, so it won't be obvious, sorry. I, I think there is a better way. So I will put the gradient. I'm acting with the gradient on the whole expectation, on the, on the whole matrix element. This is a better way of, of writing it. Um, sorry. <laughs> So I will act with the gradient on the first periodic function. And then I will come to the formula of this time. And I will act with the gradient of the HK. So we didn't have it, but this is an easier way to see. This is what we had written. Plus, I'll act on the third part. Energy. And this gives me energy. So I will have energy of K of N times. This term. This gives me the energy. This term. Plus this term here gives me the energy from here, acting on the left. So I will put it like this. This is the first and third term. I'm getting this. What do I have here? Should be zero. Um, Why? Yes. Why zero? Yeah, because uh, we are we made an assumption that the uh, period, uh, block uh, the periodic function was one. Um, that's no, one way. No, no, no. This is now for generic general block function. Oh, oh, I see. I see. Not anymore, anyway. No, no, no. This is exactly what I'm trying to do. It's not in the limit. Was still be zero. Yes, still be zero. <laughs> because this term is equal to the gradient, which I can say this is a constant. So I'm losing both of these terms, and I'm just left with this term, which I already wrote, but I will repeat it now. So we try to 
keep this formula. So my height is not too messy. Is it okay? Can you follow? You can? Yes. Okay. Um, so what do I have here? Um, so I want to make this quick again. So what I have here is I, I'll take one page in my block. So I, which, and then M. Two and two and two are actually getting cancelled. So I have this plus A square K L M. this is equal this is just a number not an operator um x squared k of n plus this is p of the picture divided by n Here I actually am missing one page. No, this is a square plus h is missing, and this is equal exactly this times h. Do you agree? A square and h. So this is equal h with of n, and all of this. One the gradient just to repeat in case of the energy. <coughs> so, by some, I mean, it's almost amazing. We managed to connect the velocity of, a, of an electron. In end level to a derivative, if you want, in k of the of the band energy, how it changes, disperses in the k. Uh, let's see the meaning of it. Um, if I make a sketch here, is it okay? Like a typical tie binding band here. This is energy and this is K. Oh, uh, Natasha, um, yes. Pelus cannot hear anything from you. Ah, Pelus cannot hear. Ah. Uh, you cannot be heard. You cannot, you cannot hear me. Um, um, what do we do? <laughs> um, you cannot talk or you cannot hear? Uh, maybe he, she cannot talk. <laughs> uh -huh. Maybe you can write. Tell us if you have a problem. Uh, I have speakers to the maximum. I hear every sound of you, even too loud. Uh, um, yeah, okay, then write the message, fellas. Um, oh, I see now. Can yes. you explain the last line because I was writing? This line here? Yes. Well, did you understand this line? Uh, yes. Okay, but then I'm looking for what I derived for velocity. Oh, I right. yes, yes. Velocity is these two terms and this mm -hmm. extra term, which I did not have any intuition for. But then, when I derive the gradient of energy there, I'm getting the same term, the same combination of the term times h bar. H bar, yes. So the velocity is equal to the gradient of energy divided by h bar. 
So in this terrible sketch, I, it's really all tilted. Um, these are the uh, brilliant zone boundaries. What can we say right away knowing this? When is velocity going to be zero? will be here, here, here. We have zero velocity. When the derivative of the energy is zero. Yeah. So. When the derivative in K is zero and the maximum. And the maximum will be at the inflection points here. So this is something which is not intuitive. That the electron, I mean, for all the states in the brilliant zone, does not have the same velocity. And that it depends purely, uniquely on, on the dispersion relation. Uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, maybe it's not uh, completely. But I, this expression that we have gotten is uh, in same way an expression of a group velocity. Um, yes, it has something to do, yes, with the gradient. Yes, uh, so I've always assumed that group velocity uh, sort of seems to be how all the electrons, or I would say in some sense, uh, packets always sort of transverse. Uh, so uh, I don't, uh, I thought, okay, all of them would. Uh... Picture of electron. Electron can be also taken as a wave packet, no? There is this uh, dual picture. You can mm. take it as a particle or as a wave packet. Mm. So it's the same. But we managed here to really derive it to, to, to it, uh, by derivation. So, yes. Um, I lost my note. Yeah. So I'll here. And then, okay. From this image here, we want to um, estimate what the current will be. We wrote before that the current minus E times V of N and K and sum over all K, all occupied K, and this is important to say, all occupied. Can you read this log? Yeah, I think you can see occupied. And you can even put two because we don't take spin into account. So each band can take two states for each K. No? From this I mean, simple expression, I, in this case, um, Okay, I can actually draw the, uh, can I go here a little bit? Or I can delete there, okay, let me. I can make the velocity here. Velocity. Well, in one D, I don't have to write the vectors now. So I know it is the zone boundaries. I'm drawing one D, but it is equally valid in two D or three D. This is just a simplification to to draw it here. Um, so it is zero here, here, and here. And to be zero. Here it is positive, it's growing. Here it is negative. This is my velocity. And then I also apply this formula to find the current. And what do I conclude? I'm summing over all the occupied K and assuming that this band is occupied. What am I getting? Uh, zero um, Why? Because it's if we sum all states we get zero yeah. plus and negative one. Yeah. So if we 
zero. That's great. I got the result, but uh, um, why is it zero? Is it is it okay? Is it intuitive? Do you expect this to be? I mean, do you expect the current in a crystal in equilibrium to be zero? Um, when the band is complicated, um, then you know. okay. Yeah, but the electron cannot move to any state because all states are. Uh, uh, equally important because it is symmetric around. So even if it's not, even uh, if it's, I, I think it's uh it's zero because uh, uh we only have the current when we apply the electric field and in crystal we don't apply the electric field here. So, in equilibrium, hence zero, uh, hence zero time. So, B, the metal is it's, it's a zero. So, this is because the system is an equilibrium. System is an equilibrium, and you don't expect zero time. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> Natasha? Yes, Evan? Uh, what's the sine curve over there, the phi to k? Sorry? I mean, what's the sine like curve over there in the phi to k curve? Sorry, I'm not getting it. Maybe it's too loud. I'm not getting it. Uh, sorry. It's velocity. Uh, uh, velocity. Velocity, yes? Yeah, the velocity, why the curve is like sine? Um, well, here you have a cosine. If you take a derivative of cosine, you get a sine. Oh, so still discussing tight binding. For example, I, I drew it as a tight band. It doesn't happen. Okay. But uh, <clears throat> it is true for also other because you have symmetry. So it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, here I drew quite a regular cosine, so it's coming. But I'm just saying, at the point of inflection, the velocity is highest because it's the largest derivative, no? In this point. Oh, uh, yes. And here it's growing, so it is a positive slope. It is point to velocity. Here it's decreasing and it's negative. Oh, oh sorry, Evan. Uh, what do you mean by saying uh, uh, tie binding? Huh? Uh, you, you said something tie binding. Ah, okay. I do hear a band. Which resembles tight binding band. But it, uh, in, in nearly free uh, model, we also have that kind of. Okay, but uh, don't call it cosine. Uh, Evan asked why is the sign? I drew here, yeah, it is the very <laughs> If you want to see that the, the parabolic one is almost the same shape, it has a very little difference actually if you draw the, the parabolic or cosine. So in the boat, you will have this shape. But the way even Evan asked question was why is the sign and say it's a cosine here? Maybe. Yeah, yes, yes. But it's also for others. It's not for the time line. You know? I don't want to confuse it. I just do it very much like that. Also, for the, it looks very similar for the free electrons. <laughs> <laughs> So as Lynn said, we want to introduce electric field because the system in equilibrium doesn't have current and it should not have current. So we want to introduce electric field. <clears throat> and our hope is that, hope and expectation, <clears throat> is that electric field, when it acts this way, yeah, and here we have electronic state, the force is equal minus e times the p because of the sign, 
will shift from this state to this state to make it move. Okay, this is the expectation. And this is energy. <coughs> I want to calculate how it goes from state K to some other nearby state, maybe K plus L. And for that, we have to use uh, something which I'm not sure you did in, the, in quantum mechanics yet, a uh, Fermi golden rule. Have you done it? Not yet, maybe. Normally it's done a bit later after this lecture. Um, so this is the final state. This is the perturbation Hamiltonian, which will depend on this field. This is the initial state, this one here, which will be multiplied by some density of the final state. But okay, I don't want to. Okay. This expression will actually give you the likelihood that you move to this state. And it is done in the time dependent perturbation theory. So you, you have to have a time dependent electric field. You know, it has this uh, here on the I and on the dependency. But okay, I won't go into that. Our assumption is that our time of measurement is so long, so slow, that this will be actually instantaneous. So I'm taking it that it has, that it doesn't have time dependence anymore. It just depends on age on that. Um, so, so, E on K plus delta K, this is my assumption to apply this. And okay. I want to find how this changes. I want to know how fast I can change the K under the effect of electric field. Okay, to find this, let me again start from something else. Let me try to find how the energy changes in time. And this I can use by expressing what I know, how the energy changes in K. Now this is all in 1D, but it is the same thing in 2D. I'm just making it easier to plot the Okay. But if I want to, from the classical physics. Now this is a semi-classical hand waving and elevation from the classical physics. What is equal to the time uh, change of uh, energy? What is it equal to? Do you remember? <laughs> so, well, I was changing the bit. Now I have a bit of vector field without, sorry. This is equal to the force times velocity. You remember the power and all these uh, derivations in some physics zero, zero, one. Okay, so it is quite tempting to make a connection because here, this is, um, Velocity is equal to uh, h times uh, 1 over h. So this will be equal h times v. Uh, now I'm again in the, in the vectors. So 
I just draw this using what we derived, and instead of changing the order, it's a scalar, so I can do it. Now it's very tempting to identify this part with me, I mean, and, but in principle, it is not obvious that it's correct. Um, you can have vectors. A times B equals C times B. And then in which case C can be equal to A plus something perpendicular. So I cannot say right away A equals C. Do you agree? But I mean, I don't want to go through this. There is a proof of this in extra in the appendix. Um, that indeed it can be shown that force equals to this without any other term. So I can express this as force. Did I get all the terms right? Yeah, and what is my force? It depends on the electric field. So this is equal one or three. Okay, so I can express the k from here. How k depends on time. And c plus some constant. So my k depends on a constant times t. And it's just growing. If I plot the k versus t, it is a linear function, no? If I disregard this sign, it just goes up or down depending. It is just a linear change. But then what happens? I mean, the Brillian zone has a limited number of K, limited range of K. It cannot be going infinitely up. So what happens when I pass a distance of the brilliant zone? So if I take in one B, the width of the brilliant zone in one B, and I identify this as um, H times this will be some special time. This will be my time to cross the brilliant zone. How do they call it here? Some period. Of oscillation. Because it has to oscillate, obviously. And I'm changing K. I'm actually coming here. I keep coming and going to the brilliant zone. So there must be some oscillation. And here I'm finding the period of this oscillation. So P oscillation is equal um, to pi over A times A. Um, Actually, this has to be in the X component only, yes, in this case, because it will just be the, yeah. So 
uh, the larger is A. The larger is the A. The smaller is the brilliant zone and the shorter is the brilliant. It will faster go. So I'm getting an effect that the electron will keep oscillating what they do before. This is the energy and velocity. It keeps oscillating, changing the scale, and this is the period. This is called block oscillation. And this is a, a very curious phenomenon, which is hard to prove experimentally. And maybe, yeah, 27, great. Maybe next time I will manage to, I will uh, derive, I will talk more about it. I will say how it is measured experimentally. And now I would just like to finish with the observation how, how this influences the current. Now we put electric field, we see that the K changes in time linearly. We find that the electron has to oscillate in the brilliant zone, has to move throughout with some period. And let's see what effect it has on the electric on the current. So I want to find the average current, I can do it as an integral. So I'm up to J, let's and put velocity and some charge. The average current, how do you put it on that? Or I can do it in the case space, this is in time. To one period average or in the case space. Um, actually, it would have to have okay. zero to two pi on a. So throughout the whole brilliant zone, I'm summing it up. Some charge and time. No, oh, and the case. It's in one D. So today I'm messing up on this letter stuff. And what am I getting? Velocity will be equal yeah, What is this equal to? Energy, because I have integral of the gradient. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes. yes. What are you writing now? Is it the average current or something? Yes, the average current. Either oh. over the period or over the whole brilliant zone. It can be expressed either way. <laughs> oh, so it can be expressed as an integral of T and integral of K? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is in K because it's a bit more, but it's the same thing actually, but it's a bit more obvious. So I have integral of the gradient, which just gives me the energy. The Actually, <laughs> tell me. Uh, Natasha, I, I don't get the connection between the integral T and K. Well, you can find the over the you can find the uh, integral of the velocity within a period. Uh -huh. Or you can find the period is the one that you take for an electron to pass the whole brilliant zone. Or I can take it into the into reciprocal space over the K, over the one brilliant zone. So I mean, just think of it. I can, uh, it is like uh, measuring the distance. If you know the period of something, how long it takes, or the distance of that period, you can do it in, in both ways. Oh, okay. And now I'm just imagining this integral. So I'm getting energy of 2 pi over A. Oh, sorry, 2 pi. 
uh, minus energy of zero. Or I can do it uh, minus pi over a to pi over a. Hmm? It's the same thing. Actually, maybe it's because now I don't see it right away. Uh, I have to draw it in this, in this picture. No? This is zero, this is two pi over a. If I draw it from zero to two pi over a. But it's the same energy. <laughs> Which means it is zero. <laughs> so what is wrong? Why why is our current zero? And we said it can only be in equilibrium. We need some field. We put the field, and still there is no current. Uh, hello? Yes, yes. Hello? Yes. Oh, I just wanted to confirm that now I can be heard. Yes. Okay. Okay. Welcome. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Fine. Okay. Yeah. In fact, uh, there are many mysteries in this. Um, so, why don't we have the current here? We are out of the equilibrium. We have external force acting on the system, on our crystal, but we have no current. But we know that if you apply the current in copper, you will get the current. Uh, because, we apply, just, because we we uh -huh. just we uh, just uh, consider in 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 the pure uh, line zone. Uh, I I think that um, because the um, it's like uh, the 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 total number of electrons go in that rolling zone equal to number of electrons go out. So the total uh, uh, current is zero. Yeah, on, a good, uh, uh, on a good way to come to it, it's just not yet clear. Um, um, was... you, you consider in a uh, mm, finite, finite zone. Yes. But I always have in a crystal. I have one with a zone. Um, crystal to crystal, but it's always one. Yes? Who wants to say, Jonah? Yeah, but uh, my was uh, coming from idea that if you think about copper, or uh, you really, the, we, we, we have some sort of impurities and scatterings in other materials. Uh, in a perfect crystal, we just have this uh, block goes nation and zero field. Yeah, it's true. And actually, um, next time, we will have scattering effect. Because we are too perfect. We are too perfect in this case. We cannot have it. We will always get zero. Even with the field, what we get with the field? We just get our electrons to oscillate. They move, they go from the end to the beginning of the zone. And it's always symmetric picture. We always get equally many on this side and on this side, equally many with negative and positive ones. Although they are moving, they are still moving, but their average is always zero. Okay, so that's for the next time. Yeah, I think 25 is good. If you want, now I don't want you to be angry with me. If you want, we can solve a problem still. Um, I will do the one from the meter, which I owe you from like two lessons ago. But uh, you tell me that. If you want to prepare for the next class, I understand that too. Um, or you can disconnect and just those who want to stay, can, you just let me know what you prefer now. Or if you have some questions, we can discuss that. Tell me. Yeah, me, I'm, I'm staying back uh, for me. Okay. Um, so. Um, Actually, so we can quickly go through the problem in the midterm because uh, oh. I think everyone got the answer already of that. So you can go quickly oh. through it. Uh, I think Pooja asked me, but I don't see her anymore connected. She was here, but she left. Actually, she made me realize it wasn't solved. <laughs> okay, so what 
I think uh, the second one, I've done the second one, is easy, but the first one, I I stuck uh, at some point in the first one uh, because uh, I'm not clearly, completely sure about some things. But also, uh, is it is it good, is it okay to use, uh, to get more, more plots uh, with Mathematica? 
Yeah, sure, sure. But for the first, for the second one, I still want to give a hint that what it means to be the same energy. You have to find the curves for which the energy is constant. Yeah, I, I think I did that. Uh... Normally, it is a, I mean, a problem for this. Thing. So you have, okay, you have a blue zone, and you have to find how it changes to the blue zone. What is the same energy? The shape of the same energy line. And for that, you first look around the K0, how it changes, and at the edges. You actually have to expand for small k around zero and around pi over a, pi over a. Um, I would be happy to look at your homework. If you send me your solutions, I will give comments. I think because we cannot talk and it's not quite the same if I just give you a solution or solve it. So you can try to solve it and give me, send by mail. I can give you comments. Actually, I've done the first one, but not the second one. It's yeah, first one is easier. It's much easier. Don't get scared, Jonah. The first one is much easier. Oh, um, but uh, I did the second one. I actually plotted uh, all these and uh, the Fermi surface and all. Uh, it was easy for me, but the first one, I guess. Uh, uh, it's just, it's just mathematical manipulation. You can get it. But it's also understanding. It's also understanding. It's not a, it can be solved purely mathematically without actually even understanding the physics. Or you can try to draw along different directions and then see how it's going to change. That's maybe more intuitive way. But you can do it either way. Just purely from formulas, mathematically, you can find the constant uh, contours or by thinking how it changes, plotting it in different directions. The first one, maybe the, the second part is a bit, it sounds a bit trickier when you have to find parallel to, to sides, no? Jonah, that's what's confusing you or the very first part? Ah, I lost you. Hello? Ah, I think I lost you. I don't hear anything anymore. But okay, anyway, the, the lesson should be finished. We have a, hello? I think we, we are thinking. Ah, you're thinking. <laughs> okay. I, I don't want to keep you again uh, just until the next slide. I'm just saying if you want to discuss a bit what is difficult, because I cannot talk to you right now, you can send me and then uh, I can write. Or, uh, we can, I can tell you what is wrong. If you wish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or you, well, you just need to send us the solution. And, and then we can discuss together. <laughs> okay, as you like. As you like. You can do it either way. Um, no, no, no. Let, let us solve first. Yeah, I also think so. I also ah. think it okay, will just understand the solution and you won't think of it. And the process of thinking, of getting there, it's, it's valuable. This is something that is really important. Just getting the right solution. I mean, you can get the same one in the exam. Um, so I think it's very important to think of it. You try to, even if you don't, if you don't manage completely. But okay, so I, I yeah, it just wanted to find out on question two. Yes. The constant the constant line is when we check at k zero pi over two and then are we having them different? Like when I check at k zero, I draw it different and also I draw for the pi over k. Like the constant line is whenever I check on pi over a, when I check on k zero, I will have them drawn separately or they have to be in just in one. I'm sorry, I cannot understand. I could hear you, but I couldn't get the whole sentence. I was just getting words, not the sentence. Sorry. Um, um, can you say it in a different way or slower? Fellows? Okay, yeah. I, I'm saying uh, when I'm plotting the constant lines. Yes, constant, yeah? Yeah, yes. I, I have to check at K0, pi over A, and the middle of the band. Yeah, first do this. Yes, yes. So um, 
when I'm plotting them, or do I have to just combine them into one band structure or I can have them separate? I don't know. Okay, you draw them here. This is something you haven't seen ever before, so it is a very good question to clear out. Um, normally, you would draw them in the breathing zone, in the case space. Oh, so you would draw it here, whatever it takes, then here, and then you would have to derive something for the in between. But you draw it in the brilliant zone, KX, KY picture. This is, I'm saying this part is not obvious. If you never saw it before, that's why it is a bit more difficult problem, even to understand what you have to do. It, it's new for you. It, it's new, I understand. So you have to know if it's going to be clear. I mean, it is going to be, because this is not any more free electron. It was trivial for the free electron. You know, it's a sphere. You just change the radius. Uh, not sorry. yes this first question um what do you mean by by constant lines is it is the constant energy or... okay if you kind of like this version which is equal to i don't know gamma constant kx a in one d no maybe better plus constant let's make it uh, um it's changing through x, kx, and ky. Now, if you have uh, this dependence, let's say, along kx, something similar along ky. But I want the points where the energy is the same. So in 1D, it is these two points. Sorry, it's a really bad sketch. It's two points in 1D. In 2D, it won't be two points. It will be something which has some contour, it will be closed line because the energy is continuous, no? Oh, so you're asking us okay. to draw the I'm contour. Sorry. I didn't oh, say so. oh, yeah. It can be, I don't know, something else. Okay, <laughs> I have a question um, related to the two last uh, questions. Um, we are asking to, to draw the Fermi uh, surface, right? So, uh, so yes. uh, do we have to proceed the same uh, thing? Just on this, yes, just on this. In this scheme, you will just find what is all. Hello? Hello? What? What happened? I think the network is weak. Connection is unstable, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's finish. I cannot see. I didn't get the answer, but no problem. <laughs> For the Fermi, yeah, you just have to indicate in the brilliant zone up to which contour, whatever, however it looks like, I'm saying this one, mm -hmm. the space will be occupied. Indicate here. Okay. So you have to find the contour which corresponds to the Fermi surface for the occupation given in the problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, I want to give you at least 10 minutes break. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and see you tomorrow. Yeah, goodbye. Bye. 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 Mm -hmm. Out of curiosity, I wanted to ask this. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about how this would look. Uh, uh, I mean, what when we started tight binding, we talked about uh, having an over complete basis. 
So if I set yep. to look at just one atom and I look at all the orbitals, uh, sort of infinitely many orbitals, and then I try to also take uh, atomic um, linear combination of all the atomic orbitals, I will sort of have some sort of overcomplete uh, basis. Yes. So I was thinking, um, uh, this is more like in terms of application, I was thinking how this would look. Um, for example, if one plays around and do maybe a DFT calculation, um, and one wants to calculate the uh, excited state properties of materials, usually, mm -hmm. uh, if one is going to consider maybe GW calculation, is you need to put like a lot of bands, a lot of empty, excite, uh, empty states. So uh, in this case, you put uh, say maybe thousand empty space, uh, empty states, and and you want to do some um, calculation. Okay, I know that this is just pseudo potential method with plane waves, uh, but if you, in the case that you want to linearize the, um, the 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 plane waves you are having, and um, in this in this case, I, I was thinking about. Uh, are we having in in that uh, in that case uh, sort of an overcomplete basis because we started with plane waves uh, and we pseudo potential method and all that we opened like a lot of uh, empty states say thousand uh, empty states. I would say so. Yes, I would say so. Yeah, I would say so. Mm. Still hold. <laughs> Any other question? <laughs> <laughs>